Welcome today to Champion Insights. Um, I know a lot of you guys are coming to this talk and like, okay, Riot Games is giving a talk. They're only going to talk about League of Legends and their esports and their bizarre stuff with that. Now, that's not the case today. Uh, we're actually going to be covering more than just League of Legends. Uh, we're going to be covering stuff from a lot of games. And a lot of the data that I'm going to be presenting today and the methodologies can be applied to your games or to your studios. Uh, we're also going to be talking about some other stuff. We're going to talk probably a little bit about K-pop, abstract expressionism in American art, and we're going to talk about scuba suits. Um, but most importantly, we're going to be talking about champions in League of Legends and characters in games overall. So, who am I? Uh, I am Nathan Blaustois Blau. Um, Blaustois is a mix of uh, Blau and the Pokemon Blastoise. Nintendo uh, attorneys, please save your uh, questions till the end. Um, I studied uh, neuroscience and political science at the University of Chicago. Uh, Jason Jones, who is one of the uh, co-founders of Budgie, was always a major influence to me. Um, my career in the games industry was started at PlayStation. Uh, I have to take a brief moment to thank the Play uh, PlayStation user research team and Justin Tanamura specifically. They got me my start in games and I owe them everything. So thank you guys so much. Um, and now currently I work at Riot Games, maker of League of Legends, and I am the Gameplay Insights lead. And we will talk a little bit more about what that is, what is insights, et cetera. Because we're talking about champions today, though, and we're going to be talking about characters and champions in game, both my favorite champion in League of Legends and also my favorite character in all of games is Yasuo. So, yeah, wow, my gosh, he's a Yasuo main? More on that later. Uh, that's certainly covered in the talk. Cool, let's talk about insights, though. So what was I saying when I mentioned that I'm the gameplay insights lead? What's insights at Riot? Well, it's a mixture of analytics, research, a splash of data science, and a healthy serving of strategic advising. Uh, in short, what we do is we gather and analyze data, both quantitative and qualitative, from our game, from our players, and we provide uh, insights, uh, recommendations, strategies uh, to our designers, our artists, and our leaders. Um, Today's champion, or today's talk is going to focus on champions. So this is champion insights. We're going to be talking specifically about how we use that data to inform decisions around the roster of over 140 champions now. It feels like yesterday that it was not that much, but now here we are at 140 in our 10th year. Um, over 140, actually. Uh, but every time I reference champions in this talk, I want you guys to know that you can apply that to characters in games. And what I mean by that is that characters are everywhere in games. It's not just League of Legends and their champions, right? We have games like Overwatch, Battle Right. We have mobile games. Uh, we have stuff like Brawl Stars. We even have mobile MOBA games. Don't say that 10 times fast. Uh, like Mobile Legends with the characters in their game. Uh, we even have you know, the new hotness, Battle Royale. Finally has you know, some uh, great character set with, with Apex Legends. And then we even have character games where we take sort of collaboration uh, of characters across multiple games and genres with something like Super Smash Bros. So in all of these games and in League of Legends, there's only one thing that is more important than characters. And, you know, sorry because I'm cheesy, but it's players. It's the people who play and engage with these characters. So the importance of today's talk is that, hey, we're looking at the most important part of your game, characters, and we're talking about the most important part of the game holistically, which is the players who play it. We're trying to understand the relationship between those two and make better decisions. So characters matter to our players. That's why they engage in so many of these games. Even, even games that aren't necessarily, you know, these competitive PvP games like Overwatch or League of Legends. We can even think about the importance of characters in Mass Effect or something like that. Um, and what I want to talk about is how these, you know, just go through a couple examples of some players who latch on to certain characters and, and build an affinity for them. So I'm going to go through three. Some of you guys might know these, some of you guys might be totally unaware, but these are three of the most popular streamers on Twitch TV of League of Legends. So these people play League of Legends for a living and have other people watch them. So first one I'm gonna go over is, is Mo, okay? And Mo is this guy, he's, he's, kinda, he's kinda this cool kid, you know, he's kinda cocky, he kinda likes to show off and style on people. 
And, and the champion he's best known for is that one that I referenced earlier, it's Yasuo, okay? And Yasuo is, is, is you know, perfectly embodies this show-off sort of style. In fact, one of Yasuo's quotes is, kill me, you can try. So very, very fitting. Uh, next, we have Pokimane, and she's a streamer who's, you know, on a different end, is super bright and cheerful, super high energy and positive, and her favorite champion is Lux. And Lux in our game is this light mage. She's the spirited, happy character. Um, she's always being positive, and uh, you know, her quote is, if you can smile, you can be the light. And lastly, uh, we have my, my dear friend, Tyler One. Um, and, <laughs> and Tyler One is, you know, hey, this guy is, is competitive. This guy is driven, competitive, fierce. He's all about, he's kind of this alpha male, all about dominating his opponents. And the character he plays and is gravitated towards is Draven, and Draven embodies that in our game perfectly. Draven is all about dominating his opponents in the early game, and is all about sort of that strength and style. Um, and his quote is, subtle, I don't do subtle. So our goal with these data is to understand the relationship between players and characters. And it's not just these three high profile you know, characters, uh, these three high profile uh, players and the characters they have been drawn to, but we're talking about the stories of millions of players across the world playing millions of hours on these characters. And that's where the importance of all of this comes from. So what kinds of things can we inform with this data? Well, let's go through just a quick list. And we're going to return to this list at the end with specific examples. But just to get your mind thinking about them as we go through the talk today, here's what I want you to think about. We can inform decisions on your current game. Uh, or the future state of your game, right? You can talk about new opportunities for your character roster, being more deliberate and informed with updating characters or updating your game. You can talk about how you would create games with the same IP. Say you're creating a new game with the Overwatch characters. Say you're taking the Apex characters and turning them into a MOBA game. You can inform that data for those games with an understanding of your current characters. You can also use this data to inform rosters with entirely new IP. Imagine you knew everything there was to know about the Overwatch characters and someone tasked you with making a new game with a similar sort of style as Overwatch. You could use that data from those Overwatch characters to help and inform what you're going to do with this new IP. And it's not just games, it's creatives too. We can talk about how we feature our characters in art and in comics and in movies. We can talk about publishing. How can we be more targeted about presenting the more aspirational characters to the right audience in our publishing efforts? And even things like physical merchandise to make sure that you know, the characters that players want to buy the merch for the most are, are getting that chance. So we'll get to these later and I'll show some specific examples. But you guys are like, okay, Nathan, you, you showed us Tyler 1, you showed us a bunch of other games. Where's the data? Okay, let's get to the data today. We're going to be covering three data sets today. Um, and let's just briefly go over what they are so you can be prepared for them. Uh, the first one is a pretty simple uh, engagement data set. It's our play rate over time uh, data. And what this basically tracks is how much players are playing a champion over the course of time. Very simple. Our next data set is similar to this, but a little bit more complicated. It's our breadth versus depth uh, measurement. Uh, and this is similar to our play rate data, but has a little bit more nuance and a much more complicated tableau graph. Much more on that later. Uh, and then lastly, we're gonna shift away from engagement data and sort of that raw telemetry, uh, and we're gonna focus on our mass champion survey. And this is something that's measuring more sentiment, more feels from our players about what they think about our champions. And this can cover things beyond just people playing the champions, but stuff like visuals, voice, personality, and how our players feel about everything outside of the game for the characters as well. To start us off though, let's go with that play rate over time. And we're actually just gonna focus on one champion in particular and go through a sort of series of stories about this champion. Oh, and sorry, one final note I do have to note. We're gonna be covering stuff from active League of Legends players Keep that caveat in mind. We have other data sets that look at stuff like 
League of Legends players who have stopped playing or potential new players of League of Legends. For today, the data we're gonna be looking at is active League of Legends players. Okay, let's go on a play rate journey. And what I mean by a play rate journey is let's see how the play rate of a champion changes over time, specifically over a few months, about a year. Uh, and we're going to be talking about Akali. Um, now, before I get into that juicy data, I am going to pose a question that we will try to answer with this data, which is what happens when a ninja joins a K-pop group? Uh, I'll have a series of these uh, esoteric questions sprinkled throughout. We'll see if we can get some answers to them. But this is what I meant when I referenced K-pop. Um, now, for those of you who are not familiar with League of Legends, I have a brief explanation when I say champion update. So let's quickly cover what that is. So League of Legends is coming up on 10 years now. It's quite a long time. And part of that longevity is that we're constantly evolving and changing the game. To do that, we have to sometimes look at some of our older characters and find ways to make them fresh again, whether that's updating their visuals, updating their gameplay, or in the case of a Akali, we did what's called a VGU, Visual Gameplay Update, the full package totally reimagining this character into something new and fresh, kind of like if we took that archetype and we're designing it today. So Akali was previously a more sort of just kind of generic ninja. Um, she, uh, yeah, was a green ninja, I guess. There wasn't too much particularly interesting about her, and we, we sort of totally reimagined her into this more sort of street-style ninja. She got these really cool tattoos, and her gameplay was made much more fresh for the current age of League of Legends. So what does updating a champion do to its play rate? Let's start the journey. So, this is Akali's play rate over the course of before, a little bit before her update, through her update, and all the way to today. The x-axis is time. You can see sort of in very small text the monthly callouts. And the y-axis is just how much Akali is getting played relative to other champions. All the other champions are the dimmed out ones in the background. We've highlighted Akali in that nice blue teal. To start off our journey, I want to draw your eyes to the very far left, the very, very far left of that uh, graph to where there's that flat line and then there's a little bump before the giant spike and that is Akali's last hurrah. So what this is is when we have officially uh, started to update Akali, we've put the new version of Akali on our public test realm and all of the players on the live servers are like, okay, it's real now. They're actually the mad lads. They're actually gonna get rid of Akali. We need to get our last games in. So all of the current Akali players will go and get those last games in. Maybe people who used to play her will go and play her a bit, and we get this little last hurrah bump. And you know, it's emphasized by Wolverine here, fondly remembering old Akali. Okay, but it's League of Legends, out with the old, in with the new. Let's talk about that update, boom. That spike on the graph is huge because this is when Akali actually drops. That's the day that the Akali update drops and a bunch of players go and play her. And these are not just the old players trying out to see if they like the new one. Uh, these are players like myself. I never had a game on the old Akali, but I saw the new, uh, the new gameplay, the new abilities. I saw the new visuals and I thought, wait, you know, I play Yasuo, I'm, I'm kind of a weeb, that looks like a champion for me. So I go and I start to play on a call as well. And then other people are just checking her out just to get a sense of what the kit's going to be like when they play against it. So, uh, you know, again, we, we sort of, we sober up after that initial launch and we get to this sort of new stable play rate, which is really exciting. Because if you guys look where this line sort of flattens out, it's so much higher than previously. You know, a Akali has played multiple times more than where she was previously. And that really hit uh, our goals for the character. We thought this was a fantasy that we had not delivered on as well, and we wanted more players to engage with her and to engage with her more. So this was looking like a success. And you know what, the success doesn't stop there. Um, what happens when a ninja joins a K-pop group? Well, I'll tell you, we get a juicy spike of engagement uh, and a lot of players playing a K-pop ninja. Uh, so what I was referencing there is of course uh, KDA. Um, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with this, Riot basically was like, hey, let's make a K-pop group. Yeah. 
Uh, so we took four champions, we put them in a K-pop group, we gave them new looks, new skins in our game, and a lot of players who don't typically play a Kali would go and flock to this because it was this really cool new visual look, new identity for her, and we saw a huge bump in uh, her play rate at this time. But all good stories have to have, you know, sort of a downfall, the downturn, so let's talk about that. In this period after KDA, we suffer an era of pro play dominance. League of Legends is also played uh, by professionals around the world, and two things happen. One, uh, she becomes very, very powerful in professional play, and is played all the time, that's number one. Number two, she becomes really frustrating for players in normal play. So not only is she too powerful, but she's also extremely frustrating. Here we see uh, actually G2, uh, it's a professional team in Europe. This is Perks, uh, one of the pro players who plays a lot of Akali. Um, if he's on your team, that's great. If he's on the other team, that's really unfortunate for you when he's playing that champion. So we get to this dark time where we were constantly trimming and nerfing power out of Akali, and the only way we could actually get her out of pro play, reduce some of that frustration, was to hit her with substantial nerfs, and nerfs are where we remove power or remove mechanics from a champion. Usually it doesn't hit play rate that hard, but in this case, I mean, we, we obliterated Akali. We just, we just, yeah, it was, it was a massacre. It was terrible. We, uh, we took so much power out of her. Uh, it was very rough. Um, I think the best way to sort of show what it, what it looked like is with this classic uh, scene from the Avengers. Um, you know, are you finally not getting banned? Yes, what did it cost? Everything. So Akali dips into this new low, almost as low as her pre-update play rate as a result of these hard nerfs. But two patches later in patch 9.5, and the patches are a major update to the game, she gets redemption. We look at some ways of bringing power back into Akali and buffing her a little bit. And so, we are able to do that and players flock back and start to come and play her a bit more. And we're seeing her play rate rise. And this is just as early as a few weeks ago, actually. And here we see a League of Legends player now, just a few days ago, playing some games on Akali. Uh, uh, wait, that looks like my match history, actually. And you know, we're gonna ignore the game right there where I went 5, 13, and 12. Um, you know, everyone has bad days, uh, et cetera. But overall, this is our story of Akali. This is her play rate journey. So just using this sort of simple metric and looking at one champion over time, we can tell compelling stories about the players who engaged with her over time, the content that was released for her over this time. And it helps us to understand this character going forward. We know where some of the best and worst states of this characters are. And so for champions where we know we want to retain some of this uh, play rate, we can always look back at this data to better understand that. And we're not finished yet. This isn't the end of the story. You know, the Akali train will continue and we'll keep tracking her and all the other 140 some odd champions over time with this. But we don't just track engagement with champions through play rate. We have a uh, really exciting piece of data to share with you guys today. This is our breadth versus depth framework. And this is another way of looking at champion engagement. And I want, I want you guys to remember that Akali journey because we're gonna come back to it framed in this new way. Uh, and maybe we'll learn some more things from that. So breadth versus depth, let's get into this and answer the question, how does Jackson Pollock help us understand champion engagement? Now, some of you guys are like, wait, who is Jackson Pollock? So Jackson Pollock is an American painter and major figure in abstract expression movement. I am not an art critic, thank you Wikipedia for that note. Um, he's widely recognized for his technique of pouring or splashing liquid paint onto his canvases. Um, so now at this point you're like, okay, you told me who Jackson Pollock is. Uh, Nathan, why are you talking about Jackson Pollock? Well, let us look at this interesting Jackson Pollock piece. Okay, it's a little bit more modern, all right, uh, a little bit, little bit brighter colors, you know, some more jagged lines, but it's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice Pollock piece, right? Wrong, incorrect, this is actually a David Novotny piece. Uh, David Novotny is not 
uh, an artist. He lacks the grimace, he lacks that cigarette in his mouth, but he does have a wonderful understanding of analytics and a Nerf gun, and that has allowed him to create some really interesting data visualizations for us, which this is actually our breadth versus depth framework. I just took out all the labels and the axes and made it look like a painting. Um, so let's actually go through and understand what this graph is. So graphing champion engagement, and to be clear, you can actually graph a lot of things of engagement with this method. So let's go through it. Breadth versus depth. Breadth is simply how many players. Uh, it could be a champion, could be selecting a, a weapon, it could be selecting a squad mate or selecting a map. On the x-axis, we're just looking at how many people are selecting something, engaging with something. On the y-axis, we're looking at depth. This is how much those players engage. So after they've made that selection, after they fall into the bucket, the yes-no bucket of has selected or has not, how often do they make that choice? How deep do they go into that selection? Finally, you might say, well, okay, if you have breadth and you have depth on x and y-axis, how did you get all of those lines? Well, let's use an example. You know, say we had that champion Akali, you know, prior to her update, and she's unpopular. She's, you know, she's down here. Not that many pe people play her. They don't play her that much. And then we update her, and she becomes a popular champion. Well, we can track that movement. We add a line in there. And over time, with each of those updates, we can see where the champion's breadth and depth go over time. So let's now explore those four quadrants, because I mentioned unpopular and popular. Let's cover those two as well as niche and broad and what those mean to us. So we're going to be looking at four champions that over the course of six patches stay within those quadrants. So again, you see those lines moving on those champions, but they relatively stay in the same quadrant over time. First one is an unpopular champion. This is Karthus, and Karthus is like this, this undead lich. Uh, he's a mage. Um, you know, one of his most powerful moments is when he dies in game. Uh, not the most appealing fantasy. Uh, so he kind of sits down there at unpopular. And we also have a Lowie. Now, a Lowie is this really cool character who has pretty unique gameplay. She summons these giant tentacles that smack opponents. Uh, it's very unique gameplay, but not necessarily the standard League of Legends uh, experience for most people. So she doesn't have that many people who play her. But the people who do play her, play her a lot. She's a niche champion. And we also have Annie. And Annie is our bread and butter mage. This is the character where you're having a bad day and you're like, I need something very simple to play and just win the game. You go and play Annie. And that's why she's a very broad uh, appeal champion. A lot of players will go and play her, but not a lot of them are going to go super deep and play a bunch of her. And then finally, we have... Uh, one of my favorite champions, he's a hype beast champion, as I call them, uh, or you can call them a popular champion, but Lee Sin. And what I mean by hype beast is that this character is all about style and show. This is a playmaker champion. Very hard to execute some of these cool plays, but when you do, it looks really cool. So a lot of players go and play Lee Sin, and they get a taste for those big plays, so they start to practice and play him more. So he has high depth to make those big play happen. Now, I told you this wasn't just going to be about League of Legends. So, Blizzard devs and Overwatch devs in particular, uh, please forgive me if I butcher this, but I want to now take our breadth versus depth framework and let's try to apply it to some other games. Let's predict where some characters would be in other games. So this is my fake data. Uh, this does not actually exist, but we're going to try and plot where the Overwatch characters are. Um, now, I... Briefly looked at third-party sites to get a general sense of where they are, and I used some intuition from League of Legends, but let's see how well we do. Uh, Blizzard devs, please correct me afterwards, along with the Nintendo legal team. Um, so, uh, Brigitte, I put down at Unpopular. I think she suffered a similar issue to Akali. She uh, was very big in professional play, and they had to nerf and take a lot of power out of her. For niche characters, we have Symmetra and Chorbjörn. And these two characters, their gameplay revolves around placing turrets. I actually intuited that, hey, Alawi is similar. She places these tentacles that beat people up for her. 
Similarly, Chorber and Symmetra, they create these turrets that shoot people for them. Uh, similar sort of idea for why they uh, exist there. For broad appeal characters, I chose to Soldier 76 very much uh, is your bread and butter shooter, just like Annie is your bread and butter mage. Broadly appealing sort of character fantasies and very accessible and approachable gameplay. Meanwhile, Mercy, I thought, was probably even more broadly appealing. That's the character where, um, you know, for those of you unfamiliar with Overwatch, there's this problem where a lot of people tend to pick the, uh, the damage characters. So you get into a game and it's like, well, I'm Tracer. Well, I'm also Tracer and I'm Genji. And someone on the team has to be like, hey, it's cool, I'll play Mercy. I'll support, I'll give us healing, right? Mercy's that very accessible healing character. And for popular, of course, you, you, it's gotta be Tracer. Tracer must be up there, Blizzard, I know it. I mean, she's the box character. She's one of the most aspirational, heroic characters in the game. And on another end, there's also Genji, and I think Genji represents that sort of edgelord, hype beast fantasy, I want to outplay everyone. So I expect him to be very popular. Um, Apex Legends. Please, respawn devs, correct me if I get this wrong, but we're gonna, we're gonna go through a couple for uh, Apex Legends as well, a bit more of a new example. Okay, for unpopular, I think it's Caustic, and the reason for this is I've looked at some other league champions like Singed or, um, or Urgot, and I, I just think the fantasy of like, I'm kinda like this like old balding dude who like gasses people is not like, and I don't think people like wake up like, yeah, like that's, that's me, that's my vision, right? But hey, uh, sorry Caustic players, still cool if, if you do like him. I also think his gameplay suffers from some issues as well. On the other end though, I think a really cool uh, character in terms of niche gameplay is, uh, is Bloodhound. And Bloodhound has this cool thing where he goes and stalks people. Uh, very interesting gameplay. I think it's something that's really appealing to a lot of people. Um, but those who do play it, they go really deep on it. Uh, for broadly appealing, I mean, of course, it's got to be Bangalore. Um, very similar to Soldier 76, right? Clearly aspirational theme, very accessible gameplay, that standard shooter in the shooter game. And Lifeline, again, very, uh, very appealing uh, visuals, similar to Mercy, and has this accessible healing kit in her game. Um, Go-to character for the people that want to be a healer. You guys already know who's going to be popular for Apex Legends. It's going to be Wraith. Uh, of course, the tryhards and the, the edgelords who want to outplay their opponents are probably playing Wraith. So I want to now come back to League of Legends after having done this little example. And let's try and understand uh, some decisions that we can make off of this breadth versus depth framework. So the first thing is looking at the popularity of marksmen and monsters. And it's okay if you can't read the specific labels, but that cluster over there in the broad section and the popular section are a lot of our marksman champions. And in League of Legends, these champions all kind of play the same. Uh, part of the issue with them is that when one is weak, it typically falls out of favor. When one is strong, players go and gravitate towards it a bit. In fact, the only sort of niche characters are the ones on that far left, Quinn and Kindred, who aren't even typically played in the same position as other marksman champions. So I would argue that, hey, maybe there's an opportunity for us. I would talk to our designer back, what's it look like to create that traditional marksman in the bot lane fantasy that has more niche appeal gameplay that people, not all the marksman players are going to play, but those who do play it will stick with it. Uh, interestingly enough, I think one of the goals of that was, or one of the goals for Jin was to be that kind of character. It ended up he just was really popular and everyone played him, but still I think this could be a cool uh, opportunity for us. On the other hand, our monsters are not very popular. Now, part of this could be uh, something that other games would struggle with as well. Um, in terms of how you view the characters in the game. You know, League of Legends is this isometric view, you're, you're looking at the characters, all the models, character models, have to be relatively the same size. So imagine you have this monster-esque character, Aurelian Soul. This is a cosmic space dragon. He creates galaxies. He's this incredibly impressive figure. And then you see him in game, and he's like, you know, maybe only like a little bit bigger than Annie, the little fire mage girl, 
right? It's this thing where it's like, okay, we've, we've promised you this larger-than-life fantasy, but it's harder to deliver it in the game. And that, I think, has caused some issues for monsters, but I also think it highlights an opportunity. For unpopularity of monsters, I think the opportunity is, hey, what's a really broadly appealing monster look like in League of Legends? We haven't quite hit that yet, and I don't think... Uh, we have to necessarily uh, be concerned or constrained with character models to hit at. We can look at other games and see extremely broadly appealing monsters. I don't know, Pikachu is a great example of this, actually. Um, so I think both of these, a more niche appeal uh, marksman and a more broadly appealing monster, are opportunities that we can identify using this data. And I want to come back now to this Jackson Pollock, and let's finish this story about a collie. So let's add in some labels. Let's kind of clear away the the, all the clutter in there. Let's not have all of the champions highlighted. And let's look at a more reasonable time frame. OK. This is a little bit easier on the eyes. But let's apply that Akali play rate story to this so we can better understand where she sits today. So right here was that last hurrah. This is right where she was before we updated her. And then you see this giant spike uh, up, uh, up into the right. This is more players playing her, and those playing her are playing her even more. And that's where her update drops, okay? Again, we, we ask the question, what happens when a ninja joins a K-pop group? We can see another sort of spike to the right that occurs here after she settles down. And this is when KDA comes out. Uh, I have, uh, with Thanos, represented that really dark time when she was extremely weak. Um, very sad time, you know, it cost us everything. But now let's go to where she is today. And right there looks actually a lot healthier than the play rate graph that I showed you previously. She doesn't have nearly as much breadth. She doesn't have tons of players playing her. But those that are playing her are actually playing her quite a lot. Uh, and this is looking like a good state for a colleague. Now, are we done with her? Is our work finished? No. There's still much more that we can do for this champion and for all of our champions. But this is how we use some of that data to track where these champions were and where they're headed. All right. Let's shift now away from play rate and champion engagement. And let's talk about player sentiment. We're now going to present some data from our mass champion survey. And the two questions I want us to answer, we have two this time, is why do assassins hate diving suits and why is Happy Windman on the other team? Let's answer those. First of all, I want to give everyone an overview of the Mass Champion Survey. There's two quick slides just to get everyone on the same page of what we mean by this Mass Champion Survey. So this survey goes out to hundreds of thousands of our players uh, where they answer questions about champions in our games so that we can get an understanding of where those champions rank on certain attributes. We also collect a lot of demographic info. We collect demographic info rele uh, relevant to us in the game, stuff like what are the classes that these players like the most? And by classes, I mean things like do they like tanks? Do they like assassins? Do they like mages? We also ask about their position, their preferred place to play in League of Legends. Do they like to play in the mid lane? Do they like to play in the jungle, et cetera? In this version of the Mass Champion survey, we only collect data from four of our major regions. Uh, those four are North America, Brazil, uh, Korea, and China. I am sorry, Canada. I, I swear I put in the flag that had the, the Canadian split in there. I really apologize to all the Canadians in the audience. Uh, I messed that up. North America also includes Canada. Uh, and we also ask things about, um, you know, uh, other demographic info, such as gender, um, splits for uh, male, female, non-binary, et cetera. Um, and another note is that this is our 2018 data. 2019 data is coming soon, and we're actually going to update some more stuff and include more demographic splits uh, in our future data, including uh, we'll be expanding our regions to Europe and Vietnam. Now, there are sort of two ways that we can ask questions or have historically asked questions with our mass champion surveys. Uh, one of them is very standard in surveys. It's just Likert questions. So it's rate your agreement. Something like Echo is one of my favorite champions. And you'll get a uh, list of options. Strongly disagree to strongly agree. Echo happens to be one of my favorites. So I'd say, yeah, okay, strongly agree. 
Another survey that we do run that unfortunately we will not have time to cover today, uh, but potentially at another talk, is one that involves uh, max diff, also known as best worst scaling. And the way this works uh, is it actually gives you more granular understanding of the rankings of, of uh, the various characters you're looking at. So it asks something like, which of these champions is your most and least favorite? Okay, so something interesting occurs here. If you ask me uh, to rate my agreement, Echo is one of my favorite champions, I'd say strongly agree. And I'd also say the same thing for Akali. But if you place this in front of me, what do I put? I can't strongly agree for both Echo and Akali, so I have to make a choice. And I choose that Akali is actually my favorite. And I also write which is my least favorite, which is Shaco of these four. And that tells us a lot more information than simply Likert stuff. For the sake of this presentation, we're gonna cover the Likert data. One of the benefits, though, of doing the Likert survey is that we get to ask a lot of questions. Uh, almost 30 questions, I believe, are asked in this survey about everything regarding the champions. Don't necessarily try to read all this. We're only going to be focusing on two today, but it's everything from VO, personality, visuals, thematic cohesiveness, uh, interest in pur purchasing physical merchandise for the champions. We look at all number of things. But we're only going to focus on two of those questions today. One is for players to rate if the champion is one of their favorites, and if the champion is fair to play against. Now, that might seem simple, but thanks to our good friend David Navati, we have clever ways of making complicated graphs about this. So let's go and look at one of those again. And what we're going to try and understand is the perfect assassin. So the graph I'm gonna show, we're gonna be looking at rating uh, of champions mapped on the x-axis and the delta from the average of all players on the y-axis. Give me some time, we're gonna, we'll walk through it all together. So first of all, we are only highlighting assassin players. All those blue dots, if you remember from that demographic information, all those blue dots are players who self-select into saying, yeah, I am an assassin player, that's my favorite class. We have only highlighted those blue players um, those blue assassin players. So what we're looking at then is the rating. A higher rating, more to the right, means that players like that champion more. For the delta from the average, if it's higher up on the x-axis, that means they like it more relative to the average player, the average of all of the classes. So what we find with this data is a champion like Zed who is this shadow ninja, this shadow assassin, is all the way to the top right. And this actually tells us a couple things. So not even just looking at assassin players, but looking at all of the classes of players broken out, Zed is actually the character, or Zed for assassins is the character furthest to the right. What that means is that Zed players, or sorry, assassin players like Zed more than any other sort of class uh, mains like champions in their class. The other thing it tells us is that it might be the case that not that many people like Zed except for assassin players because he's so far up on the graph. He's so much more liked relative to the average of players. And indeed, when we look for the other Zed dots on the graph, when we look at support players or tank players, we find they don't like Zed nearly as much as the assassin players. That makes sense though, considering he's an assassin. We also see that the character that assassin players like the least is Mordekaiser because he's the furthest to the left. He's the lowest on the x-axis on rating. However, while he might be the just overall least liked by assassins, Nautilus is actually the character that is liked the least relative to all the other characters. And Nautilus makes a lot of sense. He's this big hulking dude in a scuba suit um, answering our question back there. Uh, and all of his abilities say, hey, sit down. And assassin players don't like to sit down. They want to move about and do their Naruto runs and do all their fancy combos and stuff. But Nautilus is a champion in our game that says, hey, you don't get to do that. He has all of these abilities in gameplay that prevent people from doing that. So Zed makes assassin players very happy and Nautilus makes them very upset. Uh, I'm sorry for putting that image on there. It is definitely my favorite one in this talk, though. <laughs> um, 
So you might say, okay, Nathan, that's pretty simple. I understand that the graph was complicated, but you didn't need that complicated graph to tell me that, okay, assassin players like Zed and they don't like a big tanky dude like Nautilus. Well, the reason why I wanna emphasize this is because of how much player preferences different, uh, differ by something like class. And what if I told you guys that sometimes those differences are even more exaggerated, not by your gameplay preferences, whether you are someone who likes to be a team shot caller or leader, or you like to play damage, or you like to play as a healer, but sometimes it actually comes down to just where you're playing, what country you're in. So let's talk about finally getting to him, our good friend Yasuo, and let's talk about Yasuo around the world. We're gonna be looking at mass champion data for Yasuo, and just as we explained some of those differences of assassin players and what they like, we're going to look at how players view Yasuo, not based on if they're an assassin player or a marksman player, but actually just based on what country they're from. So, let's start with some memes. Uh, our first meme is a classic one from North America, and it's their Yasuo versus our Yasuo. And the idea here is that their Yasuo is like, and this guy has put in thousands of hours on Yasuo, and he's, you know, they're a Yasuo savant. They're, they're just gonna completely dominate your team, and, and your team's Yasuo is uh, playing the flute with their nose. Um, that's the idea is basically that Yasuo is going to just ruin the game for you no matter what. Now, here's another interesting meme that we found. Uh, this is a word cloud uh, of Yasuo from multiple regions that was translated. And there's one big word that kind of jumps out right in the middle that says science. And I was very confused by this at first. And I, and I talked to uh, members of our Riot, uh, uh, Riot Korea office. I was like, hey, like, this, this was mistranslated. I noticed that science, all of, the, all of the markings for science in this word cloud came from Korea. Why, why is that? That must be mistranslated. I'm like, oh, no, Yasuo is science. I said, well, please explain Yasuo is science. Like, yeah, it's a scientific fact. When Yasuo is in the game, you will lose. Uh, it, is, it is their version, I think a more colorful version of the their Yasuo versus our Yasuo. It's, it's just science. When he's on the other team, you're gonna lose. When he's on your team, you're going to lose. But my favorite meme of them all comes from China. Uh, and is this, it is, and I really hope Google Translate did not mess this up, but it is, uh, and I hope I also don't butcher as I say it, it's Kuai Lo Feng Nan. And what this roughly translates to is Happy Windman. Uh, in China, their nickname for Yasuo is Happy Windman because when you play Yasuo, you're happy. Um, and, and, and that makes me happy. Uh, but that's interesting. We have these different memes coming up in different, in different regions for this champion. What does the data say? What's our mass champion survey, survey say about Yasuo? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at those two questions I highlighted. Let's see what they think about Yasuo as a favorite champion and whether or not he's fair to play against. So remember, these rankings are out of about 140 champions. Let's see where he ranks. Okay, North America, he's 70, he's in the middle. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty serviceable. Not too concerned. Brazil, pretty similar to North America. He ranks at 66. And Korea, okay, much better. Korea is definitely like, hey, he's in our top quartile of champions. We're going to put him at 34. And we get to China, and he's number two. So I looked at this, and this was, this was pretty crazy. But I was like, okay, I, I can understand this. you Because know, Yasuo has actually still played a lot in North America and Brazil and Korea. They might just be a little salty about the, their team's Yasuo. Okay, I, I understand that. Let's look at what people think about him being fair to play against. So in North America, Brazil, and Korea, he ranks very, very low and fair to play against. Um, you know, in, in North America and Brazil, there's only a few champions, a couple, who are less fair in their minds than Yasuo. And I was like, I, I expect Korea won't be, or sorry, China won't be as bad as these. But, but I'm a Yasuo player, I love playing him, and I recognize that he is very frustrating. So I, I'm like, okay, I, you know, China, you can't surprise me here. And yet they did. 24. So like the difference between these are, are incredible. So we're looking at this mass champion day and we're seeing these giant regional differences in how people play with the champion. So let's try and investigate. Let's go through an exercise and see if we can look into why that might be the case. So 
Let's look actually now just at these two regions, just at North America. Hey, I included Canada in there, by the way. Um, and let's look at China. And let's see what are some of the favorite champions of these regions and see if we can tease out a story here. So we'll notice that there's four marksmen in the top for each region. So in North America, we have Jin, Lucian, Jinx, and Zaya. And in China, we have Kaisa, Vane, Ezreal, and Jinx. Jinx being the only one that's the top in both. Um, good job to August Browning, the designer on Jinx. Uh, well designed. Uh, anyways, we do notice though that there's a little bit more of like uh, the hype beast style ultra carry champions in China already with uh, Vane and Kaisa, but nothing too crazy. This is where things start to get interesting. These three champions, Rakan, Thresh, and Braum, are all support champions. Uh, and they're some of the top, top champions in North America. The only support to show up in this top nine, by the way, it's top nine because top 10 doesn't make it look as pretty. You'll see later. Um, biggest reason why. Uh, the only character that shows up is Thresh. And uh, Thresh is that ultimate playmaker support in our game. Uh, again, he's the... Uh, you, know, you can consider him the Yasuo or Lee Sin of support. Uh, we see a smattering of assassins show up. We have Kane and Echo in North America. We have Zed uh, showing up in China. And then lastly, our, our final three in China are Lee Sin, Yasuo, and Jarvan. Now, for me, I, I, I tried to explore a couple ideas right here. Okay, maybe there's a thematic component. You know, in North America, we see actually two of the most liked champions are black, Lucian and Echo. And in China, two of the most liked characters uh, are, more, are more Eastern, are more Asian. We have Yasuo and Lee Sin. So maybe it's a thematic thing. But that didn't quite, you know, fully jive up. I think North America tends to lean more on thematics for what they like and rate as a popular champion, whereas... Uh, China is looking more at sort of the gameplay, looking for that carry potential, that ultimate fantasy in League of Legends. So I actually turn to another question. What are the least fair champions in each region? And this is where things really blew up for me. And this is where I was like, ah, North America, I see. I see what you're doing. So first of all, in North America, assassins are not liked. We have, uh, for the least fair champions in North America, we have LeBlanc, Akali, Rengar, and Fizz. Um, for many people who play League of Legends, just hearing those names is going to get them upset. Uh, in China, the only assassin champion that shows up is Shaco. And I want you guys to hold on to this point. Shaco, of all of these, is the least played. Fizz, LeBlanc, Akali, and Rengar are much more played than Shaco. We then go into this other group of champions that show up way more in North America again. Some of these ultra hyper carry champions like Yasuo, Trindamir, and Master Yi. And the only kind of similar character that shows up to those in China is Udyr. Uh, and again, that pattern holds. Of those four champions, Yasuo, Trindamir, and Master Year, some of the most played champions in our game, Udir is a very, very niche-picked champion, not played that much. Finally, we round out the story with North America with two characters, and these don't quite fit the story as well, but it's Mundo and Zoe. Now, Mundo is a less popular champion. Zoe is a more sort of niche-picked champion. Um, but yeah, also, North America just really hates uh, Zoe. She's actually the number one most disliked. Um, they really have a lot of ire for that champion, which is sad. She's so cute and charming. Um, we then look at China again, though, and immediately we see this trend continue of this low popularity and high dislike. When we look at champions like Ivern, Heimerdinger, Mordekaiser, Old Nunu, not the new Nunu, uh, and Singe. And we round it out with two champions that aren't unpopular, but aren't really that popular, uh, Urgot and Draven. So what I've sort of understood here is coupling the sentiment data from mass champion and also looking at some of our engagement data, like play rate and breadth versus depth, we can start to paint a picture about maybe what North American players find frustrating and Chinese players find frustrating. It looks like in China, the champions that are very infrequently played, when they come up, are extremely frustrating, maybe because they don't see them that much. Whereas in North America, it's some of these more high play rate, high damage, high agency champions that cause frustration. 
More on this talk later, I'm actually going to be doing a much deeper dive into the regional differences and gameplay preferences of League of Legends, but this is even corroborated by some data outside of this talk that shows that North American players are actually much more sensitive to damage in the game than China. North America players think that there's too much damage, just people dying too fast in League of Legends relative to China. But lastly, I want to go through an example as we wrap up here today of how we can use this stuff to make a decision. How can we take this data and make an informed decision? And I also want to emphasize what it means to be data informed versus data driven. So let's ask the question, who are the Avengers of League of Legends? And no, this is not a spoiler that in Endgame, you know, we've partnered with Marvel and that Yasuo and Jinx are gonna show up in, in the Endgame uh, movie, but let's, let's try and imagine the League Avengers. So, I could take that play rate or champion engagement data, or even mass champion data, and look at the most popular champions, the ones who everyone gravitates towards. And I might get something like this. I might get those edge lords, right? I might get Yasuo and Lee Sin and Zed. And I would also probably get some of the more conventionally attractive female characters, especially the marksman females who are extremely popular, like Miss Fortune and Caitlyn and Kaisa. And then I could round this out with these sort of aspirational heroes of our game, your Garen, your Ezreal, and your Lucian. But there's a problem with this. We have a lot of overlap in the appeal of these characters. And so even though we're using one one lens of data, we're asking, hey, what are the most popular champions? Let's put them in the Avengers. What if we asked, what is the roster that's most appealing to the most number of players? Well, with that question, it actually changes how we could think about our Avengers. So let's do this again. Let's only take one champion from those three broadly appealing categories. Let's just take Yasuo from our edgelords and Miss Fortune from our you know, conventionally attractive females, and, and Lucian from our sort of heroic aspirational champions. And then instead of Garen, this sort of big uh, juggernaut knight guy who's, you know, it's a, it's a trope that's done over in games, let's put someone new in there. Let's put a Lowey in there. She's this strong juggernaut female. Let's put her in. And let's tie in something to some of the interesting lore in our game, the desert region of Shirima has not been flushed out in our game. Let's, let's consider putting in Zareth and Talia to better understand that. And let's not just do all of these humans. Let's, let's get a little bit of our, of, our, of our different sort of looking characters in there. Let's put in Thresh and Blitzcrank. And finally, uh, as much as I love Ezreal because I too have blonde anime hair, uh, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I just like Echo more. I think he's a cooler champion, so let's put Echo in. And all of a sudden, I think this League of Legends Avengers roster is looking a lot better. And I think it's more appealing to more players. It might not be the most popular champions straight up, but it is more appealing at a global level. And indeed, that was the decision that we went with when Mass Champion informed some of our character choices for our 2018 season start trailer, The Climb. And you can see, you know, sort of the, the visual explorations we did for champions like Lucian, Misfortune, Blitzcrank, Talia, Yasuo, and Echo for this. So to wrap everything up, there's always opportunities for you guys to be using your data for new characters. New characters, updated characters in your game. If you take your roster, your current existing roster, you can make new games with them. Uh, this is Dream Draven, a Draven simulator game, or Draven dating simulator game that uh, some of our uh, designers made during our hackathon. Uh, we have things like comics, merchandise, publishing that we can inform with this, things like Ash, uh, uh, War Mother, which is the, the comic that we've partnered with Marvel with. Or Marvel with. Um, and then it also helps us understand how our players engage with these characters, players who are cosplaying these characters, who are putting you know, so much time into learning them and to understand the art behind them. And lastly, I want to come back to one other thing. I said I was a Yasuo main. And I think a lot of this talk people have thought, oh, so... It's League of Legends, it's Riot Games, they're talking about Yasuo. I wanna emphasize that we can understand characters in any game and in any genre 
I am not just a Yasuo main. I know that that might surprise people, but I'm also a Tracer main in Overwatch. And I know I'm going to get to Apex Legends, and again, I think people, they think it's going to be Wraith, but you're wrong. It's actually Mirage. It's my favorite character in Apex Legends. Uh, probably has something to do with orange jumpsuits and orange goggles. I don't know. But on that note, I want to say this. To the designers in the audience, think about the ways you could use data to better make decisions about characters you're designing, characters you're updating, how to make new games with a roster of characters, to make sure that, it's, that they're broadly appealing, that there's also niche characters, uh, and that they're you know, globally resonant. And for my insights people, my data scientists, my researchers, my analysts, work with your designers, with your producers, with your artists. Don't just give them the data and say, here's what you should do. Work with them. Help them to be data informed. Think more about the questions that you're trying to answer with this data. And at the end of the day, make it about the players. Deliver the best experiences to them when you're data informed. Thank you guys so much. And real quick before Q&A, uh, special thanks to the Gameplay Insights squad, David Navati, Ben Steffler, and uh, Coleman Palm. And also special thanks to Insights leadership, Jason Moore, the uh, brainchild of, or sorry, the, the originator of the Mass Champion Survey, Betsy Anderson, and David Pavlis. Uh, Q&A time. So we only have a few uh, minutes for questions, but I will be going uh, outside to the lounge just out this way for questions afterwards. So, go ahead. Uh, oh, I guess it's just me. Uh, hello there, great talk. Um, I want to ask about the, the uh, slide where you talked about monster popularity and you were talking about how it seems like monsters aren't actually that popular. Um, would there be any caveat to how these characters are currently viewed in the balance of the game? Because when around that time, 7.6 or 7.16, a lot of those characters weren't really that strong and I would like, you know, what would that be compared to a patch like uh, the Stoneplate patch with Cho'Gath where he was really everywhere? Great question, actually. And uh, before I answer that, I briefly want to say make sure you guys fill out those surveys. Uh, it's important for GDC. Uh, it's important for me to get feedback on my talk. So please, please fill out those uh, surveys. I think check your email for them. The question was, and, and I'll, I'll briefly summarize it, how can we look at... Um, you know, monsters being unpopular, if during that time, the balance of the game was such that maybe monsters and a lot of those champions were just sort of weak. Well, again, that's why we do the breadth versus depth over time. So when we, in that particular graph, we only looked at a few patches, but a lot of times when we're making balance decisions about this, or if we're looking at something and thinking, hey, here's an opportunity to make something more popular, we would look at the play rate over time. Uh, and not just over a single patch, but that's a great question, yeah. Because they do fluctuate uh, based on the sort of meta of League of Legends, what's strong and what's weak. Great question. Thanks. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a simple question about the, other than the user survey, do you use the play log or data to categorize the play style? Like, I mean, Ossetian versus Tower Hold, something like that. Uh, for some of our surveys, we do collect player data based on like what they were doing in that game. We actually have a tool that allows us to ask any number of specific questions based on the instances of a game they just played in or based on their, their player account. So it depends on the survey. Sometimes we will have them self-select various aspects because, you know, for instance, they, they could have been playing a game in a different position and that might not be their main one. So sometimes we have them self-select, sometimes we grab it from uh, the game uh, data as well to draw whatever demographics we need for them. Uh, I was wondering, so you've got the chart with the like popularity, depth, and niche. Do you, do you generally try to design champions aiming at specific points of that graph, or do you try and j just make the best champion that you can and see where they land? Is that like, where does that go in the process? Great question. I mean, generally, when we're making new champions with League of Legends, we're never going to be like, yeah, we want an unpopular <laughs> champion. Um, but we do actually have more intentional design where sometimes we especially when we make shock calls about where we expect a champion to be, we'll say something like, hey, 
we know this gameplay fantasy or this thematic fantasy is not going to appeal to a ton of players, but we want to deliver that experience really, really well for the players who do like that. And we'll specifically call a champion, hey, we expect this champion to be more niche appeal. Or we expect this champion to be a more sort of broad appeal. Or sometimes where those things really align, we're like, yeah, we know this character is going to be sort of a knockout. Silas is an example of a character. Silas, for those of you wondering, was a recently designed character who had a long requested ability in League of Legends. He can steal the abilities of other champions. He was one where we were very confident he was going to be a popular champion and we designed him for that. Yes. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so when you're going in for the, the breadth first steps, you were talking about how when you made changes to a champion, how that actually affected where they were, where they landed. Um, do you guys do more with also investigating like item changes or you know rune changes or anything like that to see uh, how that also affects champions and where they land and whether it's more less on the champion and more on other aspects of the game? Uh, absolutely. Um, while it wasn't covered in here, we have I have had to do many presentations internally and, and do a lot of, of work with my team around how the marksman item uh, the items for like the marksman champions like Lucian, Ezreal, Caitlyn, the characters with the long range weapons. Um, we updated all the items that they could purchase. We've actually done it now twice in the last year. And yeah, we track a lot of stuff regarding how systemic changes to the game can affect an entire class or a position. So yeah, we do track those things as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be out in the lounge back that way uh, to chat a little bit. It's the Outlook just over here. So I'll be around. Thanks, guys.